On today's episode of Drifting, I have Billy Durney as my guest. Billy's a fellow Yeti ambassador and one of the kindest, sweetest, most sincere individuals you'll ever meet in your life. He started Hometown Barbecue up in Brooklyn, I want to say about six or seven years ago, after being inspired by a trip to Texas and walking into Louis Miller's Barbecue in Taylor, Texas. Prior to that, Billy was a personal bodyguard for some notable celebrities and important people, traveled around the world. Um, once he walked into Louis Miller's, it was all over. He was destined to be a pit master, and he's a vital part of his community up in Brooklyn. Take a listen. Hope you enjoy. Hey, big buddy. It's so funny. This is like... Um, Bring a lot of cheer, man, just to look, just see in your face. Oh man, same here. I, I told Taylor and Leanne and, and a couple of folks that like, uh, you know, this, we've been trying to do this for so long and, um, you know, obviously in person and it's not the same, but I've been, uh, I've been thinking about you a lot and, um, you know, um, really hoping to get this done at some point, you know, just to have a little chat with someone I respect and admire so much. So. No, oh, thanks man. No. Yeah. You know, all nothing but love, man. Feelings mutual. Yeah, much love to you, Blessing. Where are you exactly? So I'm in I'm I'm in a uh, town like thirty thousand people, which is a small town for for me. <laughs> uh, it's called Warwick, New York. Um, it's uh, about seventy miles northwest of of the city, and um, we bought this house about five or six years ago, and just to kind of have a retreat and you know. Being the, I, I grew up with my, you know, my grandma had a house in Pennsylvania and, um, you know, in a, you know, a summer house and winter house in Pennsylvania. So I grew up in the country and, and, you know, I never went to vacations at Disneyland or this or that. I like, we went to the, we went up to the country and stayed in the mountains and, you know, skied and, you know, hung out and, you know, did things that most, you know, for, for me, that was like the biggest thing in the world growing up was, was to come out here. It was only about an hour and 30 minute drive, but I thought I was going a million miles away to Mars and when, you know, I didn't see the open air and sky, big sky and stuff like that. So, um, so I've always wanted to have a house up in the country. And so it was a dream, you know, when we, when, you know, we were able to, um, to afford to have something up here, we said we're going to do it right. So we bought about just like six six acres of land, Perfect. and um, there was a beautiful home here. Uh, I cleared about an acre of trees, and then kind of, you know, dreamed up my dream backyard with a big twenty foot wood fired cooking line, and you know, a swimming pool, and you know, some things for the kids to run around and do, and some fire it's fire pits all over the place, and some gardening, and. Um, but it's, it's, it's just not a nice blessing, right? I'm looking outside. Today is my son Finn's third birthday. Oh, sweet. So uh, it's a really special up. day for us here. And so I, I'm watching him. He's out by the fire pit right now. And everything's coming into bloom here. So mm -hmm. all the cherry blossom trees and stuff. So it's pretty pretty uh, pretty special place to be able to kind of um, run away from big, bad New York City. And at, at this time with what's going on there, obviously, um, you know, it couldn't be more apropos that with the, you know, I'm dealing with a few little health issues. So being on this medication, it's really perfect timing for us to just spend a good amount of time up here. And, um, you know, we, because I've been so busy with work over the last few years, you know, my son's three and we've never really got to spend this kind of quality time together. So it's just overwhelming just to be able to spend this much time in a rural place with my family and just it's just me because no one can come to the home other than the the male male lady who's uh, now my our new best friend from about 40 feet um you know we i haven't seen another human being in 30 days so for me you know for my past career being you know in crowds around the world and uh, my work now being in crowds at the restaurant it's just it's kind of this eerily weird nice break in a way if you will especially as i'm healing so it's uh yeah so so we're up here and 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 um for for probably a few months at least so um while i'm on while i'm on these uh 
these anti, anti uh, these immune suppression drugs. So I hope you're going to be okay, man. Everything. Yeah, can, yeah. I mean, that's a whole. you patched up. That's a whole nother long story. But essentially, I you know, um, I I got I came back from a trip from L.A. about uh, <clears throat> May 14th, actually, be a year, and. In May 2018, I had a little bit of a health scare that turned out to be nothing. And um, it was a strained muscle. I thought I was having a heart attack. And I didn't realize I got so crazy. You know, it's so funny. You know, you, you, know, you go through the world and, um, you know, my past career, I wasn't, you know, wasn't in perfect shape, but I had to be in pretty, pretty good shape. And, you know, I was a big guy, but, um, but never, never overweight like that. And how how that happened over you know a seven eight year period you know well it's easy you're eating barbecue and you travel around the world eating the best foods in the world but you don't realize it and uh, so anyway i had a health scare in may 2018 and it turned out to be a muscle strain and i was like well you know what that's it that's a warning sign that i need to take care of myself health wise and so i basically started to you know work it out a little bit and you know slowly but surely and i winded up losing like 70 pounds or so up until like last May, I was feeling good and doing great. Came home from a trip and had some weird, um, uh, like slight fever and, you know, my stomach was a little distended. I went for a CAT scan and they actually winded up finding this thing, that this, this thing called viral pericarditis, which essentially means that you have fluid in your heart and pleural effusion, which is lung, lung, lung thing too. So they don't know really how it happened or it can happen from anything from the common cold. So, so anyway, that was supposed to get fixed up and patched up. And two months later I was, you know, rushed to a hospital having heart surgery. So For sure. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, not full open heart, but, um, but I hope this isn't part of this thing. <laughs> but it's up to you. It doesn't matter. Well, it can be. I, it's up to you really. I, I just, I yeah. just, we all me love and you and care up. about you, so you know. yeah, yeah. I mean, me and you catch up like we're old, old friends. Uh, you know, that's that, that, that's, that's spent a lot, lot, lot. Yeah, yeah. So, sorry, well, I'm eating breakfast at the same time. Good. Um, is all I need to know is that that, that you're going to be okay long term. Yeah. So I had a bit of a, a. I was doing great. I had a slight relapse. I've never been in better shape in my whole life. I'm lean. You know. I'm. You know. I, I'm. I'm you know, it looks a little weird because I'm, it's such a drastic change if people haven't seen me, but, um, you know, obviously my family sees me every day, so it's not very drastic to them, but, you know, I'm, I'm in my high school athlete weight right now and I, I, I'm lean and I feel good and I'm light and, um, awesome. uh, but I did have a relapse with this. So essentially this, 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 this disease got worse. It was called constrictive pericarditis. So, so essentially what happens is the, the sac around your heart, this pericardium gets inflamed. And when it gets inflamed, it constricts the vessels around the heart and it causes some problems. And, um, and that's what happened the first time. And then I was fine. And then it, now it re, I went to Cleveland Clinic to see the, like the number one doctor in the world is in Cleveland in the Cleveland Clinic. And um, by the time I had gotten there about 50, now it's about, 47, 48 days ago, I had relapsed and the inflammation came back. So what they thought was maybe I tapered off the medications too quick. So essentially what they do is they're going to try this. They're going to restart this taper on essentially the drug I'm on that's causing my immune suppression is steroids. So I'm on these high, high doses of steroids to reduce the inflammation. But what happens is it exposes your body to um, infection and stuff like that when you're on these things. So, uh, which is vis-a-vis -vis why I can't be anywhere around this virus thing that's happening because I would be at a super high risk for it. So, um, but I feel good. I'm and I'm, you know, I'm I'm at, you know I'm doing my thing. I'm active and um, and if this doesn't work, then there's there's one pretty radical. It's called a radical pericardectomy where they have to actually remove the entire sac from your uh from your heart which is it's only done like 40 50 times a year um, so it's a rare surgery but the people who do it are obviously experts in the field so um anyway i won't bore you anymore with my health issues i don't, I don't um that that's kind of where where that all stands but i feel good i'm have a lot of energy and you know it's really nice to be up here with my family and you know it's uh just an unfathomable 
unfathomable, unthinkable time for our global, you know, obviously you and I travel in a global world and a global community as far as our, our reach to our, our friends and stuff. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're in Texas, I'm in Brooklyn, but our, our friends and our world is way bigger than that, you know, yeah. through our, through our global friendships. So we know how devastating this is not only here in the United States and, you know, for me, New York city, obviously is getting the brunt of this thing. Um, but, um, but our friends in Italy and Spain and, and these places are really getting devoured too. So where I have close ties. So, um, you know, it's very, very, very hard to, to see. I was thinking about like you just, just starting to open up when Sandy hit <laughs> and, and, and how you were able to spring into action and, and, and support your community and just basically empty out the walk-in and start cooking all the meat you had. Yeah, well, that's for me. People on the streets and this thing, like you're, you're unable to do that because of the, the mandatory distance necessary to keep this thing from spreading like you can. Come on, brother. You know, I found a way around that. Yeah. <laughs> so so what we did was. Your response. Yeah. Yeah. So what we've done is really interesting. I was, I was lucky enough to, to share this with the, the folks at Yeti the other day. They invited me on to this major conference call that they were all having and um so what we're doing essentially is we were able to keep red hook the hometown of red hook so our flagship you know thing there and this little tiny 40 seat tavern open uh, as well as the restaurant i opened in miami we were able to keep them open for this delivery takeout business just to be able to keep employing people you know we have probably a total of 150 employees which you know to these big major companies is nothing but to me, I, I started with 14 employees and my wife and I were two. So uh, two of those 14. So we did a lot of jobs and, you know, you know, in the restaurant. And now, you know, we have 150 employees and there's nothing in the world I take more seriously than making sure that their lives are whole and, and they're safe and protected. And, um, you know, in the beginning of this, I really felt like I was letting them down because, you know, when people come into hometown, one of the things that I don't look at resumes. It's, it's a funny story with all my managers. I've never seen a resume in the entire existence of owning this company. So in, you know, eight years, I've never literally read a resume from an employee and um, people are always shocked by that. And I'm always like, well, I think just chatting with a guy or gal will let you know like where their heart is. And if I'm wrong, then, Hey, at least I'm wrong on my own merit, you know? So, um, so, one of the things I always do is promise them that, you know, you're going to be in a safe environment that I'm going to always be able to protect you and your, your, your wage, your family. And, um, and with this thing, you know, who, you know, I, I've never been through a, a pandemic before. None of us have, um, and up to this capacity, um, unless you were here around in early 19, you know, in 1917. So, so for me, I felt like I was letting people down and, you know, obviously, you know, I, you know, they didn't feel that way, but you know, at least I felt like I was breaking a promise to them that in, in my family, that's not what you do. You don't break promises and they're very sacred vows. And so we, we immediately tried to find ways to, to figure this out. So we did have to lay off a significant, significant amount of people, but keeping these restaurants open probably is still employing about a third of my employees full, basically full wage. Um, anybody who's been on health insurance with me, um, I'm continuing to pay indefinitely uh, their full health insurance, which is obviously, as you know, healthcare and pharmacy is the biggest crooks in our country. So um, we we uh, we're paying we're paying their health insurance and we're paying their their just about their full wage for almost all of them, um, all the employees. So that's really been. Uh, one of the things we've been able to do is, is keep a significant amount of people employed and then, you know, feeding our community, even the people, even the customers that are, um, you know, buying food from hometown and still supporting us in that way. It's so special um, um, to, to see them coming and, and, you know, business is actually not bad. You know, we're not obviously making money, but I don't think that's our goal. Our goal, our goal is to not, you know, it's still a business, right? And when this is all said and done, we want to be, um, continue to be a healthy business. And the, 
the fact that we were a very healthy business going into and this happening uh, is a really allowing us and being prudent with our money and having being cash positive and um, we really set the table to show our employees that hey look when you take good care of your your inner workings of your business as well then you'll be able to do these things so so we're employing people the community has stepped up and is supporting us by coming in and ordering food from the, from the restaurants um, and then there's two initiatives that I got really involved with which is what we were talking about before is yeah you're right people can't come and and congregate and, and have lines of people waiting like soup kitchen style like we were feeding them in Sandy however we've partnered with um, Ed Lee from Kentucky who is a very well-known chef in Kentucky uh, Ed is a is a wonderful guy um, who has this uh, amazingly philanthropical uh, part of his heart and soul uh, definitely one of our breed and um, Ed has this thing called the Lee Initiative and he essentially started convincing these bigger companies to use some of their marketing dollars that they weren't going to be using to donate to restaurants so we can inf so we can then tell set up systems to feed industry employees um, that are out of work you know there's 11 million restaurant employees around the country out of work and new york has a significant amount of those people so um so it was this really interesting thing and this guy named greg backstrom who owns a very popular restaurant named homestead in brooklyn and i have partnered up together and greg is really doing most of the heavy lifting we do all the smoking of the meats and the proteins and stuff like that but greg and his team over at homestead have uh, created essentially they've opened two of their restaurants to essentially make them grocery stores so if you're a restaurant or industry employee and the truth is we don't turn anybody away so it really doesn't matter if you if you come if you come to that um can you still see me yeah yeah we're good okay sorry i thought i might have lost for, oh, there you go if you come if you come to homestead um uh, between you know certain hours four and seven uh, you can get a bag of meals for a day or a week um you know we don't want people to be coming back on the trains and expose themselves to the virus so you can come and pick up a, a bag of food for a whole week that myself and our team in hometown and then the folks over at homestead they prepare the, you know salads and we've just had we just had someone donate five thousand dumplings to us and um you know hundreds and hundreds of pounds of noodles from this company there's a very famous French uh, bread baker in New York that has donated bread and uh, and then even <clears throat> as important as nourishing all these industry folks and you know you're talking about and you're also talking about you know I don't want to get into the politics of all this but you're talking about our our restaurant business you know in New York it's very well documented that a lot of undocumented people work within our our business and our community and these are when I tell you the hardest working human beings, you'll and you'll find them in you know fields of, of California and you know Eastern Washington State and all over all over the United States. Texas, uh, yeah. ma ma massive amount in Texas, of course. Um, but you know some of the most hardworking, beautiful families you'll ever know, and they're not in any of these package stimulus things, or not, they're not even helping us these packages to be quite honest. So if they're not helping us, they're certainly not going to be helping undocumented employees. So, so let's say you're, you know, let's say you're just a, a bus boy or a dishwasher who is the literal spine and backbone of any restaurant um, is the most important piece. In my opinion, um, are the people doing really the hard work um, in that sense. And this, this, this happens, you're done, you're in trouble. So you don't have food to eat and you don't have diapers for your kids and you don't have formula and your wife doesn't have feminine hygiene products that she needs to use to keep, you know, to keep herself maintained. So what Greg and his team have done also is to get companies on board that have formula and diapers and feminine hygiene products and toothbrushes and toothpaste and toilet paper, all sorts of things. So, so anyway, that's one of the things where really we, we, we kind of got around it and so we're right now just started you know a couple of weeks ago we're feeding you know a couple thousand people a week 
which is, you know, um, a good number. We, we'd like to feed a lot more and we're going to, um, we've now branched out, you know, I'm so, uh, entrenched in my community in Red Hook, obviously in Brooklyn. So we've now, um, this week or next week, we start a drop off of about 400 meals a week to, you know, we're surrounded by one of the most, uh, toughest urban housing projects around New York city and Red Hook. Um, and again, these are the people that always get the, the you know, the, the crumbs and it's absolutely ridiculous. It's, it's just not the way the world should work. So we're going to start dropping off. There's two churches, um, in, in the area. We'll start dropping off meals, pre-packaged meals, hundreds at a time. And people can just come at certain times in a, in a proper safe distancing, social distancing capacity. We'll mark off the streets and everything every six to eight feet. Um, as we do at the restaurants and, and they can come and pick up a meal and they can come pick up, you know, diapers and groceries and stuff like that. So, awesome. so those, those are the things. And then we, the last, the last part is we've had some just customers um, say, Hey, how can we help? You know, what can we do? So we wanted to make sure that we were also having an impact on first responders. Um, you know, I come from a family of law enforcement and, um, and you know hard-working blue-collar folks and you know we wanted to make sure that the people who are on the front lines are taken care of like yeti's doing with their mask program and um you know all people around the country are really gathering around finally they're they're giving our our law enforcement fire rescue emts nurses doctors the due that they deserve um you know battling one of the hardest jobs in the world this the police the 20 percent of our entire police force is out in New York City. I mean, 20% of our entire police force. That's just a staggering, staggering number. Um, so when you say, I'm sorry, Billy, when you say they're out, what do you mean? Sick. They're out. They're out sick with yeah. either COVID or they're out sick. Um, mm. You know, they don't want to come to work, some of them possibly because of, you know, the risk they're taking, the lack of PPE and, you know, and stuff like that. So, um, so, you know, we have a real problem. So we have just these donors. Um, there's this one guy out, uh, this, these two guys, they're close to hometown in a, in a sense. Um, Sean Fahey uh, and Brian Riano, they, you know, they're successful businessmen in their own way. And they've stepped up and basically said, hey, we're going to donate X amount of thousands of dollars per week. And we're going to send it to hometown so you guys can cook meals for first responders. And today is our first one. We're going to drop off a couple hundred meals to uh, NYU Langone and Lutheran uh, in Brooklyn. And then on Sunday, um, Presby uh, New York Presbyterian Methodist Hospital in Brooklyn, we're going to drop off a couple hundred meals. And these guys are just fitting the bill essentially to feed first responders and stuff. And that, you know, so, I mean, people, you know, New York has the worst rap in the world about, um, you know, people being rude and this and that and the other thing. But man, when there is a problem, we jump into action. I mean, people really rally around each other and that's what's happening here in New York. So Sean Fahey and Brian Riano, these two guys are just, uh, you know, they're, they're like these angel share guys that are just coming up and making a big difference. And you know, over the last year being around a lot of doctors, I think I have like nine doctors now, um, you know, now I'm talking to them and every one of them, whether you're a heart guy or you're a gastro person or a kidney doctor, lung doctor, liver doctor, all these doctors, none of them are doing their specialties anymore. Every one of them is on some kind of ICU or CCU or COVID unit. Um, you know, my, my main cardiologist in New York is like the head of the heart failure unit in NYU, Tish, which is incredible massive the number one heart hospital in new york he's he, he's he's on this he's on the he was on the research unit and now he's on the critical care unit you know and he's one of these guys that is just you know, he's intubating patients for covid and he's a heart specialist so um you know i have one of my best friends danny mizuchin works in the neurosurgery department in nyu and um you know these guys are usually brain surgeons and these brain surgeons are you know taking care of sick people in, in the COVID units. So um, we're, we're very, very um, aware of their sacrifice and we want to make sure they have a soft landing, at least a, at least a warm meal. That's pretty awesome, man. You know, I've always found New York, uh, 
couple dozen times perhaps I've I've gone up there and spent a little time. A couple yeah. of weeks is probably my longest stay, but I think the the idea that New Yorkers are rude is way off. That I find them to be non patronizing, which which is definitely a, that's true. You know what I mean? Like they don't have yeah. time for a bunch of small talk. But if you stop and ask somebody a question or if you're in need, they'll tell you straight up, you know. And if oh, you're yeah. if you're screwing up at a crosswalk or they're gonna let you know. <laughs> They'll move you along. They're just, yeah, they're real straight up, but also very helpful, very caring people. I, they I, are. New York's amazing. Yeah, it's a great place. Where did you grow up exactly? In Brooklyn? So I grew up in a, a South Brooklyn, uh, an area, you know, known as um, Old Mill Basin in the Flapper section. Old Mill Basin was, um, you know, exactly what we're talking about. It was a bunch of cops, firemen, sanitation workers, nurses. Um, just, you know, UPS drivers, uh, the, you know, the heart and soul kind of of America, you know, kind of place. Um, what was unique in Brooklyn is that we, you know, we have subways that go everywhere. And I now live in a community that does not have a subway, Red Hook. And um, growing up, I grew up in Old Mill Basin, which is the other place pretty much in Brooklyn that only doesn't have a subway. So um, we weren't, we weren't, um, we were kind of confined. If, in a way uh, to our own community. And uh, I wouldn't have changed it for the world. We grew up in just the, it was really, you know, you're your brother's keeper and, you know, it takes a village kind of thing. If you were getting out of line, you know, your neighbor down the street can give you a whack on the butt and send your ass home. And, 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 uh, and the, you'd rather him do that than tell dad that, that you were acting up because dad would have gave you a lot more than that. So um, what'd your dad do? Uh, well, my dad was a security expert. That's kind of why I got into the field I was prior to this. Um, my dad, you know, was a very decorate, decorated war veteran, which I speak about in the Yeti film that, you know, they were so gracious to do uh, for me. And, um, you know, I always wanted to follow in his footsteps. And that didn't work out because um, I found out that I was born with one kidney, which randomly could have um, happened because of his exposure to Agent Orange in Vietnam. So it's very, very weird how the world works, isn't it? Um, um, so uh, I followed, uh, my dad was in the security world, um, more of a f physical security expert. Um, uh, and, um, you know, then he had all sorts of, you know, odd jobs, second jobs as well, because, you know, he wanted to, he wanted the best for his kids. But you know, we grew up in a lower middle, you know, low, middle class to lower middle class kind of um, situation. But we we didn't we thought we were rich. We didn't we didn't want for anything. You know, my our parents went without so we can have. And I pretty much grew up with you know a stay at home mom who you know cooked the meals and you know took care of the home and you know which you know now watching my wife do it every day is easily the hardest job in the world the hardest work there is oh my <laughs> god women are just so much stronger than us and it's just it's not even in the, it's not even in the, <laughs> no conversations about it yeah you know, any man you know who tries to fight that argument is will lose with me uninformed every completely yeah uninformed uninformed, <laughs> uninformed exactly uh, so, so yeah, so I grew up in a kind of traditional all American type of household, always wanted to be, I would, if my dad was a plumber, I would have been a plumber. If my dad was a, whatever he was, I would have been. So you got a lot of respect for him, huh? I do. He's, he's still to this day, my best friend. We have him hidden out in the mountains of Pennsylvania. My brother has a little house up there and, uh, he had um, a triple bypass about 20 years ago. He's healthy and he's doing, he's great. But, um. And my, you know, but they're, you know, they're in their seventies and, you know, they're, you know, they don't need to be around this mess. They live in Staten Island, in the borough of Staten Island. And, you know, it's kind of uh, just not the right place for them to be. So, so I, I, uh, I sent them up there, um, shipped them a rifle and, you know, sent them up there and said, Hey, you know, just stay up there. And, you know, if anybody comes to the door, you know, you know what you got to do. <laughs> How do you, you know, um, everyone, that I know that knows you in our community, you're, you're a special man. You've got a really big heart, you're about as compassionate of a human being as I've ever met. I'm interested, how did your dad operate? How, how were you, if you did get in trouble, like what, what was the routine of, of how, how did you gain so much respect for your father? Well, the thing is like, you know, it's, it's, it's odd. It's a great question and it's, 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 it's an easy one to answer, but it's odd in this time and, 
time and era where the where times have changed so much, right? For instance, I have a 16 year old daughter from a previous marriage who is, you know, the love of my life. Obviously, my kids and as, as, as your, yours are. So like, but you know, you wouldn't even think to spank your kids nowadays. It's like kind of not in the call. Like it's not part of the program, but. Oops, I never right. feared my father in that oh, no. way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah well, I got the belt. I got it all. I got a wood spoon from my grandma. I got, you know, but listen, I will say, I say this to this day. Every one of those whoopings was well-deserved <laughs> and made me a better man. I, I, I feel, I don't know. Um, but, you know, the, that, that's not the way the world has changed. And, you know, you know, um, you know, that was never even a thought to how I would raise my kids and stuff like that. But, but, you know, I always had a respect for my father just by the way he, like, he would look at me and I would know that that, you know, I couldn't, you know, I needed to back off of a situation. He wouldn't have to, um, he wouldn't have to do more than a look or a growl. And I, I would know right, right there. But, you know, my dad was, I, I admired my dad because he was so hardworking. You know, my dad was, uh, comes from a long line of military men in his family and that's why it was so important for me to kind of I knew my brother wasn't going to go that route I have one brother and my brother went and had one of the most distinguished careers ever in the New York City Police Department and saved a lot of lives through intelligence and counterterrorism and stuff like that and um, but I knew he wasn't going to go the military route and that's why I wanted to go the military route so better to kind of keep that legacy of my family going um, but I really respected my dad's service. That was kind of the first thing as a very young kid, you know, I grew up in, so I grew up in the community that my father grew up in and my father was kind of like a little bit of a legend in the community. You know, he was a very great athlete. Um, he, you know, he had a tryout with the Yankees, um, you know, in, you know, whatever, AAA or whatever that's called. And so he was a very good athlete in the community. He was very well respected, um, in the community. And then he went, you know, my father was, you know, he's a little crazy too. He was a bit of a bar, a bar fighter and stuff like that and hung out and did his thing as a kid. But my father was, you know, he didn't get drafted. He enlisted in the Vietnam and, and, and went and um, went and had a, you know, uh, an incredible uh, historic. And my, my uncle, who is a, still a lieutenant colonel in the Marine Corps, reserve now and he's in his 70s as well you know says there were books written about my father that you know um and stuff he's done and and you know was 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 able to do and he's a silver star recipient and he served you know three tours as a as a green beret in vietnam and so i always admired that part of him and Certainly. and his, his patriotism and you know um you know my father is a true patriot and 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 uh but he also has this very, he's very tough, but he's also very, um, he's very compassionate and very understanding and he doesn't see color and, you know, the, the you know, he's, he's, he's a very, he's a very, he's the most simple man you'll ever meet, but very dynamic as well. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a very, very interesting thing. And then, then I watched him just work tirelessly. Like he worked two or three jobs. He would umpire like baseball games on the weekends to to make extra money while he put himself through college um, after after the war and stuff like that. So, you know, I, just everything he did was was what I thought a man should be and a man should do. Um, so I, it was just that oh, he was always an inspiration to me. And in that same vein, my mother, um, you know, she took care of everything. Uh, and we grew up in a house that at five o'clock when my father, my father would walk through the door at five, like four fifty nine and 59 seconds. It was clockwork. And if we weren't at that dinner table and she wasn't pulling out a cold glass of iced tea, like the, the world would stop on its axis. And it was crazy. It was, but I liked that. I, I liked, we had a sense of normalcy in our home and every, every day we ate our meals together. And at five o'clock when my dad got home and we'd all, you know, talk as a family and stuff like that and then you know 40 minutes later we'd be out in the street doing our thing but you know for that hour or whatever we were this tight unit that knew we were coming together every day at five o'clock which is another lost art in america obviously you know i i noticed that 
you know, we, we eat dinner at eight something o'clock at eight o'clock at seven thirty, eight o'clock at night. My wife, my wife eats it in one room. Sometimes I eat it in the other. Uh, my son eats at, you know, five thirty. obviously he's very young and he needs to go to bed, but um, you know, it, where it's, it's, there's no structure on it anymore. And, and I, I, I love the fact that I grew up with all that structure in a sense. And then, you know, I was a street kid. So we went out in the street and then did our thing. But, um, you know, I, I never, never wanted to disappoint my, like, I never did a drug in my entire life when I was, you know, when I growing up, not a single, single drug, because I knew it would disappoint him. You know, I, I just never wanted to disappoint my father. It was, it was just the weirdest thing in the world. Like, um, you know, it also helped that I grew up with a bunch of guys who would rather get way, way drunker than they would um, <laughs> uh, uh, do that kind of thing. But yeah, but it was very interesting to me that, you know, I always was around this man that I just admired so much and still do to this day. And um, yeah, every, everything he done d did was for the family. And, you know, that's the one thing I do carry over. And, you know, there's this saying, he says it in the video, um, the Yeti video, and and I repeat it sometimes too, but we feel that our family, when they're at, when things are at their worst, they're always at their, and we're, we become our best. And that's what we're, that's what he taught me. And that's what I tried to do during Sandy. And that's what I try to do every day through my life. And um, so it was those things that really brought me the respect for him. That's a great answer, man. It's, it's, it's neat how. Sorry, it was so long winded. It's, no, that, that's perfect. That, that, that's for the, that's, that's, that's a part of the steroids. It gives you so much energy. You never stop talking. Oh, good, man. That's, that's the best kind of, uh, kind of subject to interview the ones that say a lot. <laughs> um, but, but as a dad, you know, if you, we focus on trying to be a good parent and what, what you, what you spoke of makes it clear, like you live your life as a man primarily and being a good husband and being a, a, a being a hard worker and then that rubs off versus just being so if you spend all your time just focusing on the children then you wouldn't be able to work as hard or be as good of a husband so that's right you know we, we used to be so busy making ends meet that the kids just were like secondary they, they they were fed and they were expected to behave themselves and fall in line and as a consequence you raise better people um, I agree completely. I mean, I, I just can't so believe much attention on your kids. You end up ruining them because they, they're not, they're, they're supposed to just be in the periphery learning and watching and, and you know, and doing the right thing or getting smacked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Oh, I can, we, it's We're so funny. Uh, it, yeah. It's so, it's so, it's so funny how now my dad's like, Oh, I don't remember that. I'm like, God, I remember every one of them. I remember every one of those belts. <laughs> when you, uh, that, tried to, you tried to enlist into the military and- I did, yeah. Uh, when, when, the, when the first, when the first, um, when the first uh, Desert Storm started, I tried to enlist. Uh, started to go through the process and, um, and found out that I was born with one kidney. Um, crazy R randomly um randomly happened and obviously i was on, i was you know not allowed to to go that path and um i was that was prior i probably started in the security career probably in my early 20s and that wasn't at the level of what i was doing obviously for all those years i mean I had so many different odd jobs. I worked in finance for a little while. I worked as an insurance agent. I, you know, my first job ever was, uh, I was uh, 16 or 15 or 16. Well, I was a paper boy. Everybody in New York was a paper boy. Um, either you roller skated with a, with a, with a, we had this guy named Eddie Fritz. I'll never forget him. I'll never forget this guy. Eddie Fritz was a good hockey player. He roller skated and he had this massive supermarket wagon, like a double barrel super super. And he was like the number one paper delivery boy. And we couldn't believe it at the time. We were like, oh, Eddie Fritz. We were like, you know, 11, 12 years old. He was making like $300 a week. And we were like, you know, talking about 30 something, 30 years ago. You know, I'm 48 years of age. I'll be 48 years. You know, so you're talking about 36 years ago, or whatever, and this guy's making two, 200, 300, 250, 300 dollars a week delivering newspapers. And, you know, that was a gold mine. Um, but anyway, you know, 
but I was the batter boy for this place called Chicken Galore. And I probably should have known at the time that that would be my destiny one day, um, uh, that I would be in the food food industry business. But, um, but, but, um, but about in my early, uh, so I had all these different jobs and, and, you know, I was pretty successful at most of them. And, and, um, and then I was just like, listen, I want to, I want to take this path. And I got an opportunity to do like, uh, this part-time, I was working for like Chase Bank and like, um, for an, for a security company. And we would investigate like, you know, banks at night and, you know, we would work with the fraud unit and, you know, all these weird things and respond to alarms. It was kind of like low, low fi security job. And, and then my dad was like, Hey, why don't you meet some of my friends in the secret service and these kind of guys and see what you think about what they're doing and diplomatic security service. And I remember getting a job with another security company. And one of my first protection assignments was with Aretha Franklin. And it was just to look, I was, I think I was 20, I don't know. I was, I was young. I probably shouldn't have been looking after. I wasn't really as qualified as I should have been at the time, but, but it was only like, it was like a Grammys thing in New York city or an event at radio city halls, music halls. And, um, and I spent, I, I spent, you know, about 48 hours with, uh, with, with Miss Franklin and, and I was like, wow, this is, I could, I could see myself here. And it wasn't a celebrity thing, but it was the fact that I had, I could get back to who he was like, like always that protector. Right. Even as a kid, like we grew up in a neighborhood in a community that, you know, it was like you know, 20 guys that hung out together, 20 girls that hung out together. All 40 of those people are still friends to this day. My best friend is this girl named Dorian Scagnelli, who now is the, essentially the operations director for my whole company. And that, that girl has been my best friend for 35 years That's amazing. or more, 35 years. That's how long we go back. So, um, so that's the kind of community I grew up in. So, um, you know, for me, the security thing was kind of a natural progression. And, and so those girls and everything, I was there like their, their big brother, their protector, if you will. And so I always had that kind of in my system and then kind of, and I love planning. I'm a very strategic kind of guy. And um, I love, I love pre-planning and, and what I've learned over the many, many years now and in and in and out of protection and training with some of the best secret service guys in the, you know, on the planet and DSS and all the guys that I got the opportunity to spend some time around. The one thing that makes them all great and very effective is that they're all, you know, there's a reason that most secret service agents look like accountants. You know, they're very, very bright. They're very smart planners and the best protection men and women are great strategic planners. Um, and they're, proactive and preventative measures, not, um, not enforcement error, uh, not in the enforcement. That's why police officers sometimes don't make great protection people because they're used to enforcing the laws, which are very important, obviously, but not, but not being proactive in the, in the prevention of, of, of the crime. So, Interesting. yeah, yeah. So, so I got the opportunity to then, um, you know, be around a lot of these folks who are really teaching me, you know, how to do these advance, um, the, these advances, like you're driving to a, you're driving to an event. Well, it's not just about driving to the event, right? So, and you're not only protecting their safety, you're protecting their image, you're protecting their, you know, what if there's something on the stage and there's a wire on the stage and they trip and fall over, you're, you're protecting, you know, their reputation or their, you know, you know there's so many things you're, you're protecting other than um, their phys physicality. Medical procedures, you know, a lot of protectees are on medications for anything, you know, from, you know, uh, allergies that they need, you know, um, uh, certain medications and shots for if they, you know, um, all sorts of different things. So, so you have to be trained in a lot of different areas. But one of the things that I really loved the most was how to do this advanced planning. So you go into a location and you, they're like, well, what if there's a roadblock in one of the loca locations or what if there's traffic or, 
so they you know they started teaching me you know from day one like the, the, the you know you have to have an a root and a b root and a c root and you know how all these things work and i was just fascinated that there was this whole world out there that i didn't really understand or know about and i just wanted to dive in and what one thing i've been accused of my whole life is i dive in real deep as soon as i get involved which uh, is what happened with the barbecue and what happened with me is just a cook in general i i just dove really deep into that so so i dove really deep in and within a couple of years i got an opportunity a random opportunity i actually was was kind of on the on i was in a weird place i had just gotten divorced from my previous wife who you know, now we're really, really tight and, and great friends. And she remarried a guy named Billy, which I thought was very interesting. <laughs> um, but at the time, um, you know, I was kind of down. I was really, you know, my daughter, I left the day after my daughter's first birthday. So now 15 years ago, my daughter was 16 in February. So, you know, really rough time for me. And I, I, I took a job just to be able to support myself and her and my daughter that, you know, was way underneath what, well, nothing's underneath. I would dig a dish for the rest of my life to support my family. But, you know, it was, it was, it was, I was overqualified for the position, let's just say. And then luckily a year or two into that, I got an opportunity to, um, a job came across my way to look after a very prominent family um, in the protection side of the community and my career took off from there and um, and I was very fortunate to spend a long run with um, people that I still am in touch with and still to this day um, have a very close bond with a lot of the protectees um, have become personal friends and are now the happiest in the world because I get to feed them all the time and instead of uh, having to uh, look after them all over the world. So, um, but what it did give me, what the protection community gave me the most was you. And I see Leanne Bakunis and I see um, other people on, you know, watching in on our call here and Taylor Johns and all, all our friends at Yeti and people I would have never met if I hadn't I gone through the food world. Um, and I got an opportunity to travel around the globe and I got an opportunity to taste wood fired cooking from around the globe. And that's what inspired me to eventually my Mecca trip, which was in the amazing great state of Texas, which, you know, I have a massive affinity for um, to the point where I literally have a tattoo on the back of my leg that says Texas barbecue with the flag and uh, with the Texas flag. And Louis Miller Barbecue in Taylor, which um, changed my life forever. And, you know, walking into that place and that environment um, forever changed my life and the course of my life. And I came home, I was on a protection assignment. I was there a day or two early to do the advance work. And I said, okay, I have some time off. I'm going to take a drive out and walked into this kind of one light dust bowl town in Taylor. Um, that was probably once, you know, a nice vibrant community but when i got there it was kind of like not as much but there was this massive barbecue hall that was overwhelming i still get the goosies when i when i when i think about walking in for the first time and what time of year was that um i believe it was in i was, believe it was pretty hot i think it was in june there's no think. ac in there I think it was gnarly in there, yeah. man. I think it was, yeah. and then, you know, they don't have air conditioning. They had some no air conditioning. No air conditioning. Some fans that were like trying to blow air around. Uh, not air conditioning, fans that were trying, yeah, fans that were like rusted old fans trying to blow. Um, but I walked in and, and I tell the story about one step, and that's true. I was one step in and said, I don't know what this is, but one day I want to own a place that represents what this represents to how I feel right now. And um, waited on that line, um, ate that barbecue and just was transformed into, into another place. Um, it wasn't my first barbecue. My first barbecue in Texas was in tail uh, in Lockhart. And it was at a place called Smitty's bar Smitty's, which was, which was the, the, is a big family, uh, the Kreitz family and the Smith family, you know, the Smith, Smith Valley. They, so they had this thing. And so I went to Smitty's first, which was, it's, 
it's probably the prettiest pit room I've ever seen in my whole life and the most romantic that you've ever seen. Um, it was the first time I ever tried Texas style brisket. First time I had a Texas link. Um, and that also inspired me so much that day at Smitty's. Um, but walking into Louis Miller's was life changing. You know, obviously I give that, um, that, that, that's, that, that's, I call, I, I call them all stores cause they started as these general meat market stores. And, um, I call that store like the most important moment of my life because it got me the opportunity to follow a path. I never, you know, I was a, I was a home cook average at best. <clears throat> Our only knowledge of barbecue was dad burning burgers in the backyard that were like hockey pucks and they were terrible. And my father was the worst barbecue still to this day is the worst barbecue on the planet. One of the only things he doesn't do well. Um, well, hockey's big up there. So at least they had dual purpose. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. 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 Exactly. The Rangers could use a couple of pucks on the ice in the garden burger pucks. So, so um, did you just but, quit you up and quit your security job and just move? No, your- not that fast. And it was very lucrative at the time. And, and, and I loved it. Listen, I loved it. I miss it. I still miss it. You know, um, I was recently in Miami, um, before this, you know, probably about two months before this uh, all started in, yeah, November, December. Yeah, like, like now I was in January. I was the only, most of the month of January is in Miami. And my dear friend, Steve Hughes, um, who was the special agent in charge of the Secret Service in the New York office um, and ran the Bush detail and for, for, for those years and the presidential detail, him and I got to link back up in Miami and spend some real great quality time together and, you know, sit around and tell lies and, 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 and some truths and stuff like that as we do. And, uh, it was great to see him and reconnect and bond with him. And, um, so I still keep these ties. I still keep these connections and I'm there. It's so funny, Steve, Steve, uh, just, that just reminded me, Steve's daughter shares the birthday with my son today. And he was the first, guy to text me this morning and Steve was very influential in um you know me uh I think me having a lot of access so if I had a client if I had a protectee going to a third world country or um something like that I can tap into these great resources and um so Steve is still a special friend of mine and I still carry these relationships to these this day which is not unaccustomed to our family motto is, you know, you know, kind of when you have someone that's that special and, you know, like we call them, and I'm I'm sure this is a term you use like-minded folks. Um, When you have some like-minded folks, you keep them real close to you. And Steve uses one of them. So, Um, but it wasn't right away because I was doing well and I really loved it. I still miss it to this day. It was great to catch up with Steve and talk about the old days and, I actually told a funny story. I'm not sure he'd want me to tell this, but I'm going to tell it anyway. I don't really care. I'm not, I have a tattoo that I got right after my, you know, I didn't have any tattoos ever above, you know, where they could be seen while I was in my protection days. And right after I got a tattoo that's on my forearm here. I don't know. You can't really see it. Let me try that. Whoops. Can you still see me or no? Yeah. Yeah. I got okay. you. Yeah. I, I, um, I lost you for some reason. Let me try one more thing here. I don't know why I lost you, bud. Oh, I got you. I got you uh, clear. Also. Okay, I can get. I can get. I can get back in now. Oh, here we go. Okay. So anyway, I have this tattoo here, and it's a three-eyed owl. You know, because protection guys think they can see around. You know, behind their head with a. I'm gonna stand up and show you. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah, I got it. Yeah, so and it says keeper of secrets. And the three-eyed owl, and then there's a there's a lock here, but there's no key. Uh, and that's kind of was my 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 promise and my um to my all my protectees that ever, anything that was ever done seen by me was always gonna stay a secret. And uh, it's kind of the motto of you know the, our our community and the protection community. I don't remember where I was even going with this. What were we talking about? 
um, before the, the 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 tattoo. It was it was your friend from Miami who shares your the birthday with. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Well, the, the, the tattoos. Yeah, well, the tattoos. What the tattoo is what I was getting at. What, so I wanted to treat myself to this tattoo that would give me this memory of of um, of you know my time in the community. So so anyway, I, I had gotten this tattoo. You know to 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 uh, to say goodbye in a way to that to that to that lifestyle, but again it led me to you know the greatest thing ever, which was cooking. And then I came home and I uh, I spent about two years trying to. Well, I, I didn't have to convince my my girlfriend, who's my wife now for many years at the time. I said, listen. I'm pretty sure that at some point in the next little while, I'm, I'm going to want to leave this thing. These fancy folks that we're traveling around on private jets with and, uh, and all this great lifestyle. And I think I'm going to open a barbecue restaurant. And she was like, I think at first I was expecting the worst, but my wife is this very calming uh, gal from Olympia, Washington. Um, and you've probably been to Olympia or, or, or up in that area. And up on the peninsula, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. It's about an hour about out of Seattle, but it's, it's, it's a little, it's a small little town. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's a beautiful little town. And, yeah. But, you know, she's this calm, relaxed, uh, she's not going to like this term, kind of tree-hugging, loving uh hippie her parents were straight hippies i mean her, mo her mom and dad got like married at like two o'clock in the morning on some weird moon or i don't know the story exactly i don't remember the story but they're i mean they're wonderful people and uh, but she's very she's very different from me and my crazy wild upbringing of being a street kid and stuff like that so we make this we make this good team but i asked her i said hey what do you think about me getting into the restaurant thing? And she's like, go ahead. I don't care. Go for it. Whatever, whatever makes you happy. And, and once that was said and that was laid out, I just couldn't, I couldn't believe it really. I was like, wow, she's letting me fly. My ex-wife who's a very good woman would have said no, and you're crazy. And you know, go get, go get a job. That's going to give us a pension 10 years, you know, for 20 years from now. And, whatever but uh but my wife was like nah go fly do your thing and and obviously i did so so a couple of years later we um we actually asked her brother um for a little bit of a loan and uh and that was that we uh we we started to open hometown in red hook which was a very near and dear community to my heart and a lot of people don't know that hometown was actually named because my grandmother and great grandmother immigrated from norway and ireland and they lived in that community and it became their hometown. And that's why that restaurant or my restaurants now are all called hometown it was because uh, of, a, of paying homage to my grandmothers uh, and my great grandmother. So they grew up in the community that that restaurant is in now, which is very special to me. And, you know, the place I love and call home and support my community so deeply. And, 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 and that was it. And, you know, obviously they, uh, Five months, six months, you know, before we were going to open, as you know, the story now, um, Hurricane Sandy hits and destroys our whole building and community. And we get into action and cook for our community and, and the rest is history. And uh, I've been blessed to have the support of, you know, a good woman and a great community and, um, you know, couldn't ask for a better life. And it's allowed me to, like I said, meet some of the most unique, special people in the world. And I appreciate you saying that about me and how, how you feel about me. But I, 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 I say this out of the bottom of my heart. I, I, I watch, first of all, they'll, they'll never be I love filmmaking. I love it. I, it's one of the things, not, not actually doing it, but observing it. Every part of it, whether it be the orchestra playing in the background or cinematography, or I just, I, I'm, I'm very aware of it all. And I'm overwhelmed, inspired, and touched every single time to the max power 
when I see a Yeti film. And this is not a promotion for Yeti because they would be mortified if I was trying to promote for them. And that's why guys like you and I are affiliated with the Yeti company is because they're so hands off of us wanting to preach their, their good work. But even more so than the amazing film qualities and stuff that they do, I honestly, and this is truthfully, and, and I get pushback from some of our fellow ambassadors. I don't know how I wound up in this group because you guys are so overwhelming to me in your hearts, your souls, your physicality, fearlessness, depth of consciousness, uh, spirituality. It, it, it really is shocking to a street kid from Brooklyn that makes barbecue to be affiliated with not only some of the best athletes in the world, um, hunters, fishermen, light, you know, just there's so many, there's so many levels now to, to, to the ambassadors at Yeti, you know, I remember watching, I remember meeting Luke Bronchino. I, he, I don't, I, I'm sure he doesn't know the story. I, I, I think I might've told him that one of the, one of the, uh, the films that, you know, showings that we were at together. But I was like, man, people are like, wow, you're a tough guy. You're a man. You're like, you're this kid from Brooklyn and you're, you're, you know, all this. And I watched that thing of that guy riding bulls, man, you know, jumping on bull. I, <laughs> his film just devoured me it would like it was like and then seeing mark carter and you and ryan and you know like it's just and i can go on and on and on and on and you know with all the ambassadors you know carter andrews and all these amazing human beings and i just sometimes i just pinch myself and say i can't believe i'm in the company of you guys and i just want you to know that you know, this, this, this street kid, this knucklehead from Brooklyn, anytime, any place, anywhere, man, you need me, I'll be there. And, uh, um, I'm, I am so overwhelmed and inspired by you and, 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 you know, your life's journey and your life story and how you impact the people that you come in contact with. And, um, um, you know, through fishing and through so many other, Hey, here comes the little guy. I can hear him. Happy birthday, Finn. Yeah, yeah, he's the dog. My dog Otis is coming in. I, it's Otis Redding, my dog Otis Redding. What? Yeah, I'm still on my wife's whispering. You guys can all come in. Show them, show them off. Show them off to us. <laughs> yeah, he's good. Nah, he, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, Finn, you want to come say hi to my friend? He said, no, I'm fine. Hey, but I want you to. He wants to say happy birthday. Happy birthday, buddy. Come on, I want to say hi to my friend JT. He wants to say happy birthday. It's not his birthday. It's your birthday, Goose. Anyway, that's my birthday. So, like, I just want you guys to know, like, you know, it's, it's really, it's really a significant impact on my life to, to know that that I'm, I'm even in the same breath with some of you guys, and I, I really, I, I, you know, it's, and when we get together, it's just the greatest moment. I, you know, we, we've only met in person, you know, a couple of times. And th that impact is like, I feel like I'm talking to someone I know 40 years. Like That's I just don't you have Billy Durney right there, man. I mean, I don't, I don't look, feel, look, I don't feel I, like I'm, we're I'm no people. physical specimen myself. And I, I feel the same as you. Like I'm, I, I just feel overwhelmingly uh, fortunate to be part of this community, which is really what Yeti represents to me much, much larger than, than making cups and coolers. What separates them from, from, from the competition in their industry is the family that they've built around that product. And it's a genuinely non-hard sales approach to, to, to building community. And it, I, I don't have a lot of friends from my, my, kid, my, my Houston days as a kid. They either got married real young or got in too much trouble and got locked up. You know, I, I, well, I have a lot of those too. The greatest friendships, the greatest relationships I have currently are, are, are through Yeti, through my friends at Yeti and through you guys. And so, look, I'm, I feel exactly the same way. And 
and the, the bull riders and some of the skiers and surfers, like as in terms of their their physical ability, what's equally impressive, man, Billy, is your sincerity and the size of your heart, what you do for your community. I think you you're right right at home, right where you need to be in this group of people. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. You know, I just I also recently saw <clears throat> a, a Yeti post something. Um, I don't know if it's a um, I don't know what exactly it was, but it was about Luke's wife um, and the kids and like how they're, you know, her spirit and that and that, and that. And it's so funny because I'm sure that Luke is wherever he is in the world right now, having no idea that he's impacted this knucklehead from Brooklyn like he has. And, you know, we're, the, the one common dom denominator, I think is, you know, we, I think we're always searching. I think you and I were on a stage talking about like, what's this common denominator, you know, one night. And, you know, I, I think the thing is, is that we're all just, we're all just willing to, to, to be vulnerable in a way, you know what I mean? Whether it's, and I was never that guy. I was never allowed to be vulnerable. I was not the person I was. And I feel as I get older and I get more vulnerable and I just feel like, you know, I'm, I'm so much better of a person and I'm so much more um, useful in the world. Um, and I think that's kind of the common thing. I think we all have, we all come from such different places. Um, you know, I mean, your story is just overwhelming to me. Um, one, one time I'd like to switch this around and really, cause I know I hate talking about myself, although I've been talking about myself for an hour now, I'd really like to talk to you about, cause, and I know a lot of, we, we've had conversations and I've heard you talk about your, your upbringing and, you know, the, the, the great parts, the bad parts, all of it, you know? So, um, but what, what I find is that we've all kind of broken through whatever those struggles were or whatever those um, barriers were and found ourselves as men and women. And, um, and I think that's, that's that unique bond is like self-awareness and being a better man and how to be more useful in society. And instead of me, 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 me kind of thing. And, you know, I think growing up, I was very much a me, me, me kind of guy. Um, always like, you know, what can I do? I, I, I felt like I was, you know, trying to be something I wasn't for a long time. And when I broke through and, you know, and, and found that I could just be the person I wanted to be. I think that's pretty natural as you try to find your path, just to focus on yourself. And once you get there and how, you know, how, how much more fortunate could you be to find your passion, have the freedom to pursue that with a, with a supportive uh, woman in your life? That's, that's as good as life gets. Certainly, certainly is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, you know, my wife and I've been talking, we, you are just, we're just tickled. You know, this is the first home I ever bought. Um, and I was, I bought it in 2015. Uh, so I was, uh, you know, I was like 42, 43 years old and, I didn't, you know, growing up in New York, it's so expensive. You don't really think that you can ever own a home. You know, I had to come 70 miles west to get one, but, um, but we just feel so blessed to have this house right now and to have this property and to see our son, you know, roll down the hill yesterday, you know, uh, you know, um, in, in the beautiful green grass and see all these cherry blossoms blossom and, like we, we just, we just pinch ourselves that life brought us to this place where we can just breathe in, um, and, and share all the hard work that we have put in over the years. And, you know, we just, you know, we just, we just getting this bond that's, that's really unique right now because we're forced into this situation and I'm sure there are people struggling with this. I know there's jokes all over the internet about, you know, kids going back to school and wives doing this, but I think the one, there's nothing good out of this, except the one good thing. And I, and this is, this is, this is, this is really for me, the most important thing I'll ever say today is that every single American, every single human being in our global community 
has done one thing wrong their whole life until now. And that is we have taken every day for granted because we didn't know this. We didn't know what not being able to have access to a grocery store or each other, or, and it's different in rural places where they can still do that. But here in the city, you drive down Madison Avenue and you don't see a human being where you would see, you know, 400,000 people on Madison Avenue crammed on a street. Um, and it now it's forcing us to say, wow, we took, we can't see our grandmas. We can't see our, I can't see my parents. I can't see my daughter um, who's, you know, lives with her mom somewhere else. Cause you know, um, I can't go see my folks because you know, they're at risk where they are. And, you know, so I think the one thing that we all will, will not allow to ever happen again is to take these moments for granted. And, that that's my takeaway from this is I will never again sit around a dinner table with a bottle of wine and a bunch of friends and a great meal and ever not think that that was like the most important thing that I ever do because whoops I can you see me or no I can that is an empty table yep and that is going to be empty for quite some time. And that is not the way I ever want my table to be again. And um, we're gonna, that's the lesson. We're that's, the lesson on that. that's, that's a beautiful message to end it on, Billy. I'm going to let you get back to your, to your son's birthday. I thank you for the time. We need you to, to get healthy. Yeah, yeah I'm. Your community. Your, mean, mean fighting machine, brother. Your community, including all of us at Yeti, we need you to stick around and, and provide that perspective, that love that you bring. And, and we, we, I'll care, be here. we care deeply about you, man, and I know you care deeply about us. Thanks Indeed for spending your time this morning. And here's to all you guys in Brooklyn, New York. It's been hit so heavy from this deal. Hey, hey come say hi to JT. Hey, hey, come here real quick, please, Finn. Okay, but we got to, you picking up me cereal? What a good boy. You got to say hi real quick. You just got to do a wave. Come here. Come here. Hi. Come here. One, one big wave. Say hi to my good friend. Here, and then we'll say hi to us, buddy. There he is. There he is. Hi, Look at you. Hi, pumpkin. How's say it hi, going? wave. Oh, Whose awesome. birthday is it? Look at you. Whose birthday is birthday? it? Three years old? Wow, man. That's so right. awesome. Yo, we love you, pal. Love you Say too, bye. Buddy. Bye. Much bye. love to you. Peace. Peace, buddy.